Good morning, everyone. After a wonderful previous session, now we'll go on to our talk, which will be on the FACO fundamentals and beyond. I now call upon uh, Dr. Preeti to talk on understanding your FACO machine, technology and the flow pumps. It's one of the most important things and the most uh, vague things for postgraduates. And she's an experienced uh, cataract and refractive surgeon and uh, used to teaching students. So let's see how she explains this complicated thing. Thank you. A warm uh, welcome to all. Very good morning. I thank the organizing uh, committee members of Tricon 2023 for this opportunity. I thank my chairman and moderator of this session. I am going to be speaking on understanding your FACO machine, technology and flow pumps. So uh, the basic function of FACO machine is basically, I say eat and clean up. So you need to emulsify, you need to irrigate and you need to aspirate. So we have to deal with the ultrasound energy and the fluidic circuit. So this is the basic schematic representation of a FACO machine. You have a console. The console has the uh, fluid pump. And then you have uh, the irrigation fluid outside the console. You have an irrigation line which is connected to the FACO handpiece. The ultrasound power from the console is also directed to the FACO handpiece. And from the FACO handpiece, you have the uh, aspiration line going out into the fluid pump. And uh, all the controls are connected through the foot pedal, which is also anchored onto the con console. And this is the FACO handpiece with inside the eye. So this is the basic foot pedal positions. Uh, traditionally, you have the uh, three positions, one, two, and three. The, in the position one, it's only irrigation. Position two is irrigation and aspiration. Position three is irrigation and aspiration and FACO power. Recently, there is a dual linear foot pedal as well, wherein the one and two is uh, linear and pressing down. The third will be uh, towards horizontal direction, similar linear control. And uh, I always tell my postgraduates about the auditory close. So you will hear a click when you are in the uh, foot pedal one. That's me. That means the flow starts. And then when the pump starts rotating, you'll have to. If you carefully observe, you'll hear the sound as well. And then when you are in the position three, you will have the buzz sound, which will uh, know which from which we will know that the fake has started on. And um, so the power, now we'll go on to the ultrasound. The power of FACO is the ability to destroy the nucleus. So to destroy the nucleus, you need an amplitude, you need a frequency and a coupling force. Talking about the amplitude, the amplitude is generated through a piezoelectric crystal. Earlier, there was a magnetorestrictive handpiece. The handpieces which come now are having the piezoelectric uh, quartz inside them. The electrical energy which is supplied through the console then translates into oscillation. More efficient power generation happens. And uh, it heats up a little slowly. And the, it is lightweight, a little bit costlier compared to the older one. And it's fragile. But all the latest ones have the piezoelectric quartz in them. Then we should know about the handpiece. I'm going a little fast because it's a lot to cover. And um, handpiece is, uh, you'll have, this is the handpiece. The handpiece has got a uh, tip. And uh, the tip is covered by a sleeve, if you can see the pictures. And then uh, connecting from the handpiece, as I said, there are three lines. Uh, you have the uh, ultrasound uh, power, irrigation and aspiration. And uh, it will either be a straight tip or a tip with a bevel. A little bit about the FACO needle tip. Generally a titanium tip, it has to oscillate the frequency of 40 kilohertz. Amplitude will be, uh, we call it in milli inches. It is around 2 to 6 milli inches. Or, and then uh, the crystal is within. And uh, the diameter of the FACO tip is important. You have either a 19G or the 20G FACO tip. And the bevel angle will have, uh, each of this will have a specific uh, uh, impact. You, have, you can have 0 degree, 15 degree, 30 and 45 degree. And then also we need to know about the various FACO tip designs, which as we go ahead we will know uh, in our career. Uh, the current tips are tub uh, turbosonics, uh, ABS, and you have a micro tip, you can have a taper tip, you will have a flare tip and you have also a Kelman tip. These are all the terminologies which we should no, and nowadays we also have the interpret balance tip with a uh, different design uh, uh, which has a specific purpose and then the interpret, uh, interpret hybrid tip as well which will have a better cutting efficiency. So this is the latest along with the basics. And then uh, going about to position 3 which is the ultrasound energy. So in this maximum of foot pedal 1 and 2 will already exist. And the energy is applied, have to be applied when in contact with the cataract so that you reduce the side effects of the same. And we should know what is the stroke length. So the FACO power, this is expressed in percentage and is the stroke length of the FACO tip. 
If you see the, the stroke length is the length of the needle movement. See the picture, you will have a movement from the baseline. One stroke cycle will be one forward and one uh, backward together. So an increase in FACO power results in increased stroke length. Traditionally, the longitudinal FACO, we should know that the FACO tip cuts when it's moving forward and aspirates when it is moving backwards. And then uh, this is a bit on how the FACO uh, works to uh, break down the nucleus. Uh, it creates an acoustic wave, mechanical impact because of the jackhammer effect, cavitation, implosion, fluid and particle wave and heat will be the side effect. I'm not going to depth of it because this is more of a technology lecture. If I go into the depth of it, this itself can be a long a talk by itself. So this one we should know, it is like a FACO creates a repulsive effect, it's like a jackhammer repair and it's around 28,000 to 50,000 times per uh, second depending upon the machine which we use. So I generally call it as a boxer's punch. It's not about how hard you punch, it's also about how frequently you punch. So you should have more, more stroke length and should also have a good frequency. This frequency determines how much the amplitude will be transformed into productively on penetration into a nucleus. So frequency is the speed with which the needle moves and it is constant. For example, it's 28.5 kilohertz per millionum and 40 kilohertz per sovereign. And then also the coupling force. You have to be close to the uh, person who you punch. So the nucleus has to be brought towards the FACO tip. You can either uh, achieve it by having a good followability or you press the nuclear fragment with the second instrument. So that is the importance of having a second instrument. So this is about the uh, uh, cutting technology. Now I was talking about the longitudinal. If you see closely how it vibrates, the torsional will have, a longitudinal will have a forward and a backward movement. The torsional will have a, a movement on uh, sideways. So in a longitudinal, when you, as I said, you cut when you go forward and then you aspirate when you come backward. But when you come backward, there can be a little chatter effect in the uh, uh, longitudinal. But uh, the chatter effect is less and it is more efficient and torsional. So the side effect will be, you have to, uh, heat is generated, so you have to prevent the incision burns. And this is a sleeve which is around this tip, which will help in having the flow through it. And you can prevent the, uh, and the heat which is dissipated does not go directly into contact with the wound area. And this is a newer tip where it also has this four bridges. Uh, it helps in not making the sleeve move much. And also this extra gap which is seen there um, help, uh, helps having a more irrigation flow. If somebody gives me a pointer, it would be better. You have any pointer with you? Yeah. So this is a good fluid flow increases uh, heat dissipation. And uh, yeah, thanks. And lower power setting will decrease the heat production. And uh, this is the absolute FACO time which we should know. It's a measure of total FACO energy delivered to the eye. Some in machines, it comes as CDE, it's accumulative dissipated energy. And we should aim to have a decrease in FACO time so that the side effects are less and it is more efficient. So it's basically the absolute FACO time is FACO time into average FACO power. So we have to tighter that accordingly. Um, so how, let's see how do we, these are the few terms which we should know whenever we are handling a FACO machine. So uh, I request my chair to permit me a few more minutes. Thank you. So. We need to know what is FACO continuous, FACO pulse, FACO burst. This is continuous energy delivery, variable FACO power depending upon the foot pedal depression. And this is pulse de energy delivery, variable FACO power depending on the foot pedal depression. And in burst, you have variable burst interval depending on the foot pedal depression. Every burst but will have the same power. Advanced FACO modulation, we should know a little bit about the hyper setting and variable duty cycle. I'm just telling the names. I think there's a talk which will elaborate this further. So this is hyperpulse rate, wherein you will have almost like a continuous uh, uh, power, which is 100 pulse per second. And duty cycle is how much time the FACO energy is on and off. You can have 50% duty cycle. We can have 20% uh, duty cycle, which means 50% 50, 50 means it is uh, 50 uh, um, half on, half off, which is 20. It is uh, little, it is 20 and 80. Uh, 20 on and 20 off and uh, this is some other type of pulse shaping which is called punch and then the basic thing is you have to make uh, understand your machine and modulate the settings accordingly so that finally you have a happy patient and a clear post-op cornea that was about the FACO power a little bit about the FACO fluidics this is the basic terms which we should know which is called aspiration flow rate it is the rate in which the fluid flows out of the eye. So flow rate therefore helps in bringing the material tips towards the tip. And we should know what is a vacuum. Vacuum level is the difference in pressure between the atmospheric pressure 
and the pressure inside the aspiration tubing. So the vacuum helps in holding the material and rise time is how quick we can have the vacuum. Basically, there are two types of uh, pumps which will help in the fluid flow and generating the vacuum. This is a peristaltic pump in most of the machine, uh, which is currently now, it's all the upgradation of this, this pump. So we should know what is peristaltic pump and venturi pump. In peristaltic pump, with the mo movement of rotators, you have the vacuum which is built and it drains into a soft cassette. And in venturi pump, it is by the gas flow and it drains into a hard cassette. And this is, uh, flow is constant until occlusion and flow varies with the vacuum level with respect to venturi pump. And the tubing size, if it's a small bore, you need a high vacuum. If it's a low vacuum, if it's a large bore, you require a low vacuum. And this is just a, a physics which is uh, telling us that the flow is dire in, uh, directly proportional to the radius of the flow. And we should know what is surge when there's an occlusion. Dr. Preeti, sorry to interrupt. Uh, due to the paucity of time, we need to finish that speaker. Sure. Sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Uh, can you finish off? Yeah. yeah. So this is the surge. So uh, one thing which I want to tell you in this is make sure the inflow is always greater than the outflow to prevent the surge. And uh, we have to make a more non-compliant tubing for the outflow so that the surge is prevented. And uh, these are all the ABS is the aspiration bypass system which is currently present. And uh, we, are, we have active fluidics in the recent machines now which do not depend upon the gravity fluidics. And then these are the uh, New Year cassettes which help us preventing the uh, extra surge. So thank you very much for the uh, opportunity and time. Thanks a lot. Dr. Preeti was much faster than a FACO surgery while delivering the presentation. With pioneers sitting over here like Dr. Paneer Salam, Professor Dr. Venkatesh, I think when they come up to speak, they'll tell us much more about it. And uh, quickly, without wasting much time, I'll call upon the next speaker, please. To Dr. Abhirama Sundari, and she's going to tell how to protect the other layers of the eye while we all eat the cataract. Good morning, everyone. First, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for the opportunity. So I'll be talking about uh, ophthalmic viscosurgical devices. Uh, viscoelastics are also known as uh, viscosurgical devices, which forms an essential component uh, in each and every step of uh, cataract surgery, whether it is being FACO or SACS. They, ha they are solutions with dual properties, where they have a viscous property of a fluid and elastic property of a gel. Their use has become almost a necessity in many ophthalmological procedures. So briefly about the history, viscosurgery is a term coined by Henry A. Bellas. He mainly worked on the structure and the biological activity of hyaluronone, a viscoelastic present in the, uh, all the tissues. Sodium hyaluronate was the first used OVD in 1972 as a replacement for aqueous and vitreous humor. Since then, the ophthalmic surgical procedures has undergone a considerable advancement. The main compositions of viscoelastic is sodium hyaluronate, which is a biopolymer present in the connective tissue, including aqueous and vitreous, chondroitin sulfate, which is a major polysaccharide present in the cornea, and hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, which is a component of plant fiber. An ideal viscoelastic should be optically transparent and clear, non-toxic, non-inflammable, cost-effective, sterile and free from any reaction inside the human eye and should not interfere with wound healing, should be easily infusible and removable and retained during phaco emulsification and should not interfere with instruments and IOL placement and should also protect the corneal endothelium and should not obstruct the aqueous outflow. These are the rheological properties of OVDs where uh, they determine their behavior and the potential benefit of using them in specific situations. All these uh, following rheological properties that act synergistically, uh, which, you, uh, which are used to characterize each OVD. Uh, elasticity is nothing but the ability of a solution to return to its original shape after being stressed. It allows the AC to reform after deformation. Viscosity is the resistance to flow determined by the molecular weight. It denotes the lubricant and protective action of OVDs. Pseudoplasticity is the ability of the solution to transform when under pressure from a gel to a liquid substance. This enables the AC removal of the agent. Surface tension denotes, uh, determines the coating ability of OVD. Lower the surface tension, better the ability to coat and adapt. See, OVDs are uh, classified into two main groups, cohesive and dispersive. 
cohesive they have the consistency of a gelatin which means that uh, they cannot uh, coat or flow as well because they are much thicker and have a higher molecular weight uh, these agents are easier to remove from the eye at the end of the surgery because the entire bolus of ovd is uh, cohesive and once the once part of it is pulled from the eye via the suction tip the rest tends to follow dispersive uh, ovds are uh, like uh, it has a con consistency of a syrup or a honey which coats the ocular tissues very well and uh, they are much thinner and have a lower molecular weight and they are very difficult to remove at the end of the procedure these are the few examples of uh, cohesive and dispersive ovds visco adaptive is a newer group of ovds where uh, the substances change its behavior at different flow rates lower the flow rate it acts as a cohesive and the higher the flow rate it acts as a pseudo dispersive this is a new year uh, classification uh, adopted in 2000 by by uh, uh, ashnoff et al uh, it was updated uh, considering the analysis of uh, zero shear viscosity and uh, uh, cohesion dispersion index according to this classification uh, it is uh, ovd is a classified into four types like uh, cohesive dispersive visco adaptives and combined agents so an ideal uh, uh, the ovds are mainly indicated in cataract surgery starting from the main incision incision creation to the iol uh, uh, placement uh, during incision creation it keeps the chamber uh, maintained and pressurized during rexus it maintains the anterior chamber depth and flattens the anterior lens capsule and uh, during emulsification it uh, coats the corneal endothelium and during uh, iol placement it maintains the space and keeps the uh, empty capsular bag open and dispersive ovds acts as a tamponade in cases of posterior capsular rupture apart from uh, cataract surgery it is also indicated in uh, intraocular delivery of dyes where uh, there is uh, where it uh, where the dye is mixed with ovd it helps in the staining of the anterior lens capsule and it can also be mixed with an anesthetic agent which prolongs the anesthesia uh, it uh, it also helps in other procedures like glaucoma surgery uh, uh, keratoplasty retino retinal detachment surgery globe repair in case of perforating injuries these are the uh, few techniques where uh, both the group of ovds like cohesive and dispersive are used soft shell uh, technique is uh, the method of getting the best of both the types uh, uh, it can also uh, it, it is it helps in all the types of uh, phaco cases in specific situations like uh, uh, floppy iris syndrome broken zonules high uh, myopic eyes and ultimate soft shell technique where uh, it is a third step where the balanced uh, salt solution is uh, injected under the cohesive ovd which, uh, which is used in white cataracts to stain the capsules so removal of ovd is very important at the uh, end of the procedure whether uh, we are using a coaxial or a bimanual uh, method uh, the key is to get the ovd out of the eye without damaging the uh, capsule or the iol there are a few techniques like rock and roll technique where uh, uh, the optic is angled over one side where the probe is uh, uh, we can get the probe under the um, optic and the ovd is removed tapping technique is nothing but uh, tapping in the center of the iol spinning technique is where the iol is rotated 360 degree uh, to remove the ovd entirely from the eye uh, sorry um. Uh, the side effects of uh, ovd if the ovd is retained inside the eye at the end of the procedure it uh, causes few side effects like uh, secondary glaucoma where uh, the viscoelastics clogs the trabecular meshwork where we can see the iop rise within 2 to 24 hours and resolves spontaneously and capsular block syndrome iol surface crystallization uh, pseudo anterior uveitis post operative uveitis and uh, hypopion so the take home message is no single ovd is ideal under all circumstances a thorough understanding of these properties will enable the surgeon to choose an appropriate ovd in special situations thank you uh, thank you dr abiram sundari that was an excellent presentation very descriptive and i love the slides which were very useful for all the postgrads also the way of describing all your ovds thank you i think the most important thing is removal of the ovds and what it can lead to very commonly we see most of them post operative uveitis very commonly that we see and that is one of the most common to see and crystallization of the anterior surface of the iol which is commonly seen so it's a uh, take home message for all the post graduates to completely remove all the viscoelastic substances within the anterior chamber thank you uh, next uh, request dr pani selam uh, authority in uh, feco he needs no introduction a uh, person who has been uh, long standing in uh, phaco emulsification uh, welcome sir welcome to tricon uh, 
We have an audience are waiting for your other thing. Thank you. Respected chairperson, friends, good morning. Why should settings are important? Or any surgeon, whether he is an experienced surgeon or a beginning surgeon, the concern is I should not drop the nucleus, I should not break the capsule. And the next day the cornea should be clear. It's natural. So we go with the goal of safety and efficiency. So what do you need? The correct technique, the proper use of technology that you have. Skill is important. FACO is a precision surgery. Everything is measured in millimeter. And inside that, there is only that much space is available. So how are you going to handle it? Yeah. So how do you make the incision? If your incision is slightly bigger, there is a leak. Consequently, further problem. For in FACO, every step properly done helps the next step. If you bungle in one step, the next step is much more difficult. And the mindset is, we always think the FACO needle is operating. It's actually our right leg is operating. We control the whole thing with your foot pedal. And if you keep the FACO needle at the center most of the time, you are safe. So next you should understand the machine, technology. Dr. Preeti elaborately described about the machine, but you have to go back and read, and then understand the principle that's operating that machine. Many of us, when we see this machine, when the technician sets it up, that's the first time, and the, probably the last time we see, but we go into the surgery first. There are a lot of things in that. Each one you have to go and learn experience. So settings, only two things are important. One is flow, the other is power. In flow, this is it, inflow, outflow. Inflow is determined by your bottle height. So, and that maintains your uh, intraocular pressure. And the height is measured from the eye level. And outflow is by the aspiration flow rate. The aspiration flow rate is the pump that faster it's, it's like the speed with which the fragments are attracted to the tip and the fluid goes out in that speed. So you have to know what that speed is ideal. And the vacuum is the next one which controls the, and it actually grips the nucleus for further maneuver, not allowing to shatter. So this is a fundamental thing about flow. We'll just... Uh, the old uh, video, I mean, just want to so just understand this, this point. What is the aspiration and the vacuum? So the aspiration, if you see, it will attract things. So you should allow it to come to you. You should not go and grasp it wherever it is. And as the vacuum increases, the aspiration goes up. The uh, fragments are clinging to the tip. It helps you to emulsify. It helps you to chop. These are the things you should understand. Next is surge strength. You are given a machine, any machine, and you should know what is its maximum capability because you want to prevent surge, how much the vacuum can be set, and it can be really tested. Suppose you do the fragment uh, removal. Start at a lower level. I have set it at 360, and then you start emulsifying that piece. There is nothing, no surge. Then you raise it to 400. 450, 500. Each time look for the surge. It's not because the other fragments are keeping, but there is a forward bulge. At 550, you'll just see. Yeah. 
Now I set it 550, just watch. Just watch. So there is a forward movement. That is the limit of that machine. So your limit should be much below. You don't require that much uh, vacuum in all cases. Next is power. Power, as Dr. Preeti said, it is continuous, pulse, and burst. But many of us do not use the burst mode. It's one of the best mode for your heart cataract. Because the whole purpose of using the power, you should reduce using that power. That helps your cornea better. So, it is, so far we talk about the machine. Now, we let us look at the cataract. So, I always look at the density. It is not grade 1, 2, 3. I broadly classify into soft, a medium density, and a hard one. For each thing, the settings differ. In the technique, what you, if you're a beginner, it's better to use a divide and conquer. As you evolve, then you can use a direct shop. That's what the advice I give. And in that also, the settings changes. And you know the steps. Sculpting, fragment removal, epinucleus, cortex, visco. Each of the settings automatically changes. There are special situations. Peco settings cannot be for one size fits all. So, big zonules, high myopia, floppy iris, small pupil, in posterior capsule rent, the settings has to be modified. And finally, this is how you should set up the parameters. Look at the density, look at the steps, and the situation, whether your ideal your settings are there. You should learn that. So this is how I do it, because I see I can customize it. It's an Alcon Ligion machine. So it's a procedure, divide and conquer, it's a soft. I set the vacuum as 380, the linear uh, torsional FACO, and aspiration flow rate is 30. There is also something. There is a, I don't use the continuous irrigation. I use the patient eye level. We can fix it. And these are the lower, lost steps. Various steps. So you have to understand, go through that, and then see what you can do. There is a thumb rule for a soft cataract. You can decide whether I need a higher vacuum or a lower vacuum, whether power is needed, whether it should be in pulse mode. All these things you can have your own discretion, your own algorithm. Finally, experiment. Don't stick with one size. Do something, learn that, and then experience that. When that comes, your surgery will be good. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for highlighting all your experiences. I think postgraduates should uh, really learn from such legends who've been in the field for such a long time. And I always tell my postgraduates, uh, there is no question of a preset parameters for each machine. It's all tailored. And my mantra for all the postgraduates is, bury your ego and glorify your clear cornea. That's the most important take-home message and a mantra for all the postgraduates. Bury your ego, okay? Don't go by anyone else's techniques. Use your own technique in which you're good in. Bury your ego and then go for a glorify a clear cornea. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your address. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and especially Dr. Achana and Dr. Sriram. Today my talk is going to cover capsulorexis, wound construction, and some tips for the budding surgeon. Capsulorexis in the 1980s independently discovered by three of them has transformed cataract surgery. The advantage of capsulorexis is that it doesn't have any tags. All the steps of cataract surgery, including not only cortical wash, including your cracking and your rotation become safer. There is less uveal contact with the IOL to the iris, lesser PCO formation, and because the lens is going to be placed in the nodal point, the refractive accuracy improves in this era of premium IOLs. So you can do capsular excess using the manual mode, which is using the cystitome or the forceps or the micro forceps. And in the cystitome, it is a shearing force where you run the cystitome parallel to the pupillary margin so that the flap moves around. Whereas in a rip, um, ripping force, the zonules are pulling to one side and your uh, cystitome, your uh, uthrata is going to pull to the opposite side so that like the vector forces, that 
rexes moves tangentially. So as you go around, you have to change the direction towards the centripetal pull every time so that the rexes forms in the plane that you want it. Femto laser can be used to do capsulorexes, and in that it's a plasma photo disruption, and the fine cavitation bubbles that form are the ones that are going to nick the capsule. And as you can see, because of that, there are fine irregularities at the capsular edge, which is not the same as the smooth rexes created by the manual mode. Femto laser can be used to size the rexes, which is either sized to the um, center of the lens, or it can be sized to the center of the pupil, depending on the situation in the eye. The Zepto is precision pulse capsulotomy where it's a highly focused, fast, multipulse, low energy discharge and it is applied simultaneously and instantaneously which gives us a perfectly circle um, capsulotomy using the nitinol ring. If you compare the three, the ca cheapest of course is the cystitome and the manual capsulotomy but it is, has the steepest learning curve. The Femto is, uh, the cost is an issue but it can give you precise uh, capsulotomy openings but because of the irregularities it can be a little weak when you stretch it too much and capsular rupture can occur because of the cavitation buzzer, bubbles formed. Anatomical factors that you need to keep in mind as a surgeon are the corneal magnification factor, which is about 1.15 to 1.2, which, so if you make a 5 millimeter excess, it's actually around 4.7, and the zonule free zone starts coming down as they grow older, so the capsulotomy can be much smaller than what you think it is through the cornea. When you do femto laser, especially in small babies, because of the elasticity of the capsule, the actual size of the capsulotomy can be slightly more than the one that you thought it to be. So keep all these in mind when you're sizing your capsular excess. Capsular excess becomes more difficult when the situation is not optimal, like the cornea is not clear or the pupil is small, and also in eyes where the chamber is either too deep or too shallow. In intumescent lenses, it is a difficult task and it's always with fingers crossed that a surgeon does it. And the initial nick has to be very small and then you use a saline cannula to aspirate out the ex uh, hydrated cortex and then either use a micro forceps like in this case or a nutrata to complete the procedure. When you use a nutrata, you have to use a main wound whereas in a micro forceps, you can continue with the side port so you have a better chamber formation. And in vitrectomized eyes, see, remember that the chamber is also going to be extra deep and the zonules are going to be a little spoilt because of the previous surgery. In children, the main issue we have to use a nutrata is because there is no nucleus beneath which can give you the support which the cystitome needs for doing the capsulotomy and the elasticity also should be kept in mind. Coming to wound construction, the corneal astigmatism is always proportional to the length of the uh, uh, tunnel and inversely proportional to the depth of the tunnel and the further we are from the main wound, the, from the limbus, the better, lesser is the astigmatism. The sclerocorneal tunnels are safer, especially in budding surgeons, because you can always extend it later on in case you run into trouble. And it is ideal in microphthalmic eyes and in eyes with low endothelial count. You start about two millimeters behind the limbus and then enter just beyond the palisade. Femto laser can also do capsule, um, sorry, uh, main incisions, and it is from posterior to anterior, it's extremely precise, but you still have some tags which may have to be opened up using the uh, repositor or the keratome. And, uh, the, if you compare the astigmatism created by the femto laser against an experienced surgeon, the femto laser loses hands down. And if you come to the wound construction, it can be uniplanar, biplanar, or triplanar. Main thing is the intrastromal portion has to be at least 2 to 2.2 millimeters to give you a stable wound. And the entire fluidix that you talked about will go to a toss if your wound is leaking. In a triplanar wound, which is usually done in a sclerocorneal tunnel, the dip and then the horizontalization of the keratome will prevent a chevron forming there. The, if the wound is too short, you're going to have a leaky wound through the entire surgery, which is going to also cause iris prolapse. And if you have too long a wound, the problem will be that the instruments will not be able to move freely inside the eye and then you can have overlocking. Wound burn and fish mouthing are the others which are also going to contribute to your astigmatism. Coming to the problems for the neophyte, let us take one by one, which is the first is how to make a cystitome. One third of the cystitome, the beveled portion, will be the ideal length to make, so that if we aim at one third, you'll end at one half. Longer makes it very difficult to take the flap around, we may hit the cornea. The second bend is not fixed, actually it should be about 45 to 60 degrees. It depends on the depth of the eye. If it's a very deep anterior chamber or a deep set eye, make it lesser. The third bend is something that the surgeons can introduce if they feel that the eye is too deep. Most important is the grip that we don't talk about, where you should hold it in a position so that you can rotate the syringe, thereby creating 
in your circle. Where to initiate the rexus? Make a start at the center, scratch and use your rexus in the other half of the eye. Wherever your tunnel is, opposite to that is the most comfortable portion of the eye, both for visualization as well as for manipulation. And how to end? The last one clocker is always from outside in and do it in one shot. Don't stop or pause at this stage. The last one clock hour, you have so much of the flap around and so completing it in one go and at that point, even if it's a cystitome, it's going to be a centripetal force. The third is how to size it. You can go by the pupillary dilatation, that is an indirect clue. If the pupils are seven millimeters, you know you have to leave a one millimeter gap on either side when you're doing your capsulotomy. The second is you can keep the nucleus as a mark. It's about, five. if it's an NS2, it's around five millimeters. The third is to keep the flap flat and take it around and use the flap itself as a mirror image for your excess. Remember that the, when you draw a circle, what is going to determine the size of the circle is the size of the radius of the circle. So your flap is going to be the radius and if you move your flap around in an arc with the radius being the same, the excess size will be the same. So if you are going to have a, uh, if you move the flap out, the excess is going to run out and vice versa. Coming to the subincisional area, which is the waterloo of every surgeon, remember that your instrumentation is the side port is the fulcrum. So when your cystitome tip is at 6, the syringe should be at 12 and vice versa. And remember, you have to use it as a seesaw. So when the syringe moves towards the center, the tip can touch the cataract. The third bend also helps in the same way. This is the last one showing the video of a new surgeon struggling at the side port and then because he is not moving the cystitome in the way that he is supposed to, so the cystitome doesn't go, the corneal folds are occurring. Whereas when it is a comfortable surgeon, you can see how the cystitome is moving all over the anterior chamber. And you can see when this end is here, the tip is there. And when the tip goes towards 12, you can see that the cystitome moves on the other side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sripriya. It was very comprehensive and one of the best part in this presentation was uh, she really stuck on to the basics. Uh, there are pioneers sitting in this hall, I do understand, but for the beginners and who have transformed into an early FACO surgeons, for you just this was literally basics over there. She made it so clear uh, how to do a rexus, how to do an incision, what are the precautions you need to take and what you should not do. That was much more important. For every FACO surgeon, uh, the primary uh, factor is the uh, capsular rexus, which is going to be very, very important uh, primarily when you, uh, I mean, uh, proceed with the FACO surgery. And uh, she made it very, very comprehensive, very nice. Thank you. And uh, we'll go to the next speaker, please. On Professor Venkatesh, to tell us how to manage the nucleus. We have all made the eye ready for him to tell us how to eat it up. He's a veteran surgeon and he's an experienced uh, teacher also and a speaker. Thank you. So let's get this thing up clear about the buzzer. The first buzzer is for seven minutes, right? So one minute. Okay. How does this work? This is a buzzer. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Doctors, so I think I'm going to take this as a uh, case scenario basis based on the density of cataract, and I'm going to tell you what what is a technique that works best. I'm not going to go into basics like divide and conquer, stop and chop, etc. But I'm just going to give you what is the technique that works best in certain types of cataracts. And we start with uh, soft cataracts. All of you know that soft cataracts are probably the most difficult types of cataract to handle because of cheese wiring and crater formation that occurs every time you employ the FACO power. So the safest and probably the easiest technique to do is hydroprolapse. So in hydroprolapse, you have to create a large capsular excess that is about 5.75 millimeters and then use a hydrodissection cannula. You have to take it to the side and not across the lens. And then with the injection of fluid, the lens will hydroprolapse and it will lift up. So once this happens, visco is used and a second instrument is kept on the side. And using a very low FACO power of just 20% and using pretty high vacuum of 250 to 300 millimeters of mercury, the nucleus can just be gulped down. This is, or you can use your epinucleus setting. 
Now, what is the flaw with this technique is that you have to go for a larger Texas. We know that with the use of premium IONs, we need to have a good overlap of the optic with the Rexus. So a 5 or a 5.25 millimeter Rexus is the ideal Rexus. Because when you get the overlap, you'll get the effective lens position. You'll also have PCO formation will be less. But if you aim for a large Rexus, the decentration, the tilt, the torque, et cetera, will occur over a period of time as a capsule undergoes fibrosis. So I have devised a modification of the hydroprolapse technique, which I call as um, endonucleus delineation and, and uh, hydrolift. So in this case, as you can see, I'm performing just my routine 5 mm capsular rexus, though it's slightly eccentric. I create a cortical cleavage hydrodissection. I follow it up with a hydrodelineation. Remember, you don't have to prolapse the entire lens. You have to just take out the nucleus. The nucleus will easily come out of a 5 mm capsular rexus. So once I have delineated the endonucleus, I go in with a phaco probe. I'm using a vacuum of 300 millimeters of mercury so I can impale this nucleus and lift it up. So you see that in a bevel down position, just giving minimum amount of phaco power, I'm impaling, holding it with vacuum, lifting it up, and then just bringing it up in the AC. So I'm just prolapsing only the nucleus or endonucleus, not the entire lens. And for this, it is enough that you have a capsule rexus size of just 5 to 5.25 millimeters. And the advantage of having a capsule rexus size of, uh, or to this dimension is that it will enable you to push the intraocular lens into the back, there will be a good overlap of the optic by the capsular axis edge, which will again give you better post-operative results, better centration, etc., over a long-term period than employing a larger size capsular axis. The epinucleus is removed with the same uh, parameters. Now, this is a polar cataract, and you see that how the hydrodelineation and lift can work very well in a polar cataract as well. In the key in a polar cataract is that you don't do cortical cleavage hydrodissection because there is reportedly a dense addition between the posterior capsule and this polar nodal cataract, which can cause the posterior capsule to rip. So what you do is with the help of a, uh, I prefer to use a bevel cannula, you inject multiple aliquots and then you hydrodelineate the nucleus. That was done with the retroglow in place. So I, uh, whenever I finish with the hydrodelineation, I switch to oblique illumination because it helps me to underline the cataract much better. And you see that I'm again doing the hydrodelineation and the endo lift of the nucleus. This is a very soft lens. So just the endo lift of the nucleus is enough to emulsify it. Now the handling the epinucleus can be done uh, by using visco uh, dissection and pulling out the epinucleus. When it comes to harder grades of cataract, the technique of choice would be a direct phaco chop. However, you can also do a stop and chop, but a lot amount of energy will be utilized for this. Now, there is a reason why the lens is called the crystalline lens, because it is crystalline in nature. It has got intrinsic fracture zones because of the creation of the lens as such. Um, because uh, the, the various uh, sutures in the lens creates multiple fracture zones. So once you are able to lollipop the nucleus using sufficient amount of power for that particular grade of lens, and if you use sufficient amount of vacuum, say 300 to 400, 350 millimeters of mercury, once you hold it, you can use the sharp chopper to initiate the crack and then going into the depth of this crack that you've just initiated with gentle lateral separation, you can create the separation and creation of fragments. So what you notice mostly in this technique, the beauty of this technique in direct chop is the power utilized is just about 20 to 30 percent of the procedure. Much of the work is being done by mechanical forces. So mechanical forces will not damage the endothelium, uh, whereas phaco energy, ultrasonic energy delivered in excess will damage the endothelium. Therefore, the direct phaco chop is um, a procedure that combines the best of both worlds. It enables you to break down the nucleus. Also, you see that in this harder grades of cataract, I don't break the nucleus just into four quadrants. Because once you have, uh, the larger the nucleus, endonucleus, as you know that the endonucleus becomes larger and larger, the harder the cataract grade is. So if you create four fragments, then all fragments will be large. So I create at least six. It will be better if you do even seven or eight, because each fragment then becomes a sizable small pie, which can be removed, brought to the central safe zone, and then emulsified using the parameters. So this is the end of the procedure, and everything has been done, and the pupil, of course, has become smaller. Let's move to a different case scenario. This is a Mogagnian cataract. 
Rexes, of course, would be extremely difficult, but I'm already uh, showing you from where I'm, uh, the Rexes is already completed. I'm going to show you just nucleus management. In these types of cataracts, I find that compared to direct vertical chop, the horizontal chop tends to score over the lens. This is a small, hard, mobile nucleus mass. Okay, and if you try to do a direct chop and the chop slips, then the sharp chopper will go right through and hit the piece. There is no epinucleus cushion or epinucleus cover to protect the posterior capsule. So I have a minute more, right? Yeah. So now I'm impaling and holding on to the endonucleus, and what I have is a blunt chopper. Now the difference between blunt chopping and direct chopping is the direct chop, you use shear force. That is, you hold, you lift, and the chopper moves downwards. Whereas in a blunt chopper, you use something called as compression force. A compression force is you take it to the periphery and bring it towards the center, and this is a compression force, which is, uh, which is much safer when it comes to protecting the posterior capsule. Of course, the advantage in a Mogagnian cataract is that the edge of the lens is clearly visible. So you don't have to fish blindly in the periphery. So the horizontal chop, generally, if you have different grades of cataract, you don't want to push the instrument to the periphery in order to create the chop. Okay? So in these cases, when especially in Mogagnian cataract, a horizontal chop is much better. Yeah, I'll finish my time and I'll finish my talk too. Uh, there's nothing, I just wanted to show you small pupils where direct chop works uh, well, and you've already seen the direct chop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Dr. Venkatesh. A quick question to you uh, regarding the chop. I, I saw you know most of the hard cataracts are using a, a much sharper chopper. What is the size of the chopper you prefer for a lower grade or a higher grade or a mog again? Yeah, it's not a fixed size. So this is uh, Dr. Mohan Rajan's chopper. So this is the uh, what I bought from Appasami. It is uh, catalog 1989, I think, number. And you have in A, B, and C. So A is 1.25 millimeters, B is 1.5, and C is 1.75. So I have all three. So if it's a grade two, I generally use A or B chopper. And if it is a grade uh, three plus, I use uh, the 1.75 millimeter chopper. That beveled uh, cannula that you're using for your hydro dissection? It's a McIntyre's cannula. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is again, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you see it in the catalog books. I prefer the bevel to a round. So many people use a round cannula. The problem with round cannulas, I find insinuating under the rex's edge uh, is difficult. And in case you do, you're not exactly underneath the edge to create the cortical cleavage. So the bevel helps you to find your direction much better. Also, the flow is uh, from above in a bevel. So you get the nice cortical cleavage hydro dissection, whereas the flow through a round is bank central. So you may miss the direction. Uh, I saw you uh, using a blunt uh, this thing, uh, chopper. Yeah. Advantages of a blunt chopper in a case, three, three plus cataracts. So if it, see, if this was not a Mogagnian cataract, I will do a direct chop. Okay, only in Mogagnian cataract where the periphery of the lens is very clearly visible. See, you know, the entire cortex is liquefied. The endonuclear size is just about five or six millimeters. So in this case, I don't have any qualms about taking a blunt chopper to the equator because I'm under direct visualization. So only under such situations, I use blunt chop. Otherwise, 99.9% .9 of the time, I use only the sharp direct vertical chop in the center. Thank you, Venkatesh. Thank you. Call upon Dr. Sridhar Bharatan to give the last talk of this session, which is on cortical wash. So you cannot relax just because the nucleus is out. He's going to tell us what all you need to do about that. And he's professor at Lakshmi Narayana Medical College and an excellent quizzer or two, speaker too. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, the audience and uh, my esteemed colleagues and chairpersons, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here and look at this wonderful audience and uh, deliver this little uh, talk of mine. All the hard work has been done by the surgeons before me, and, uh, but unfortunately, this is where the money game is. You ult ultimately have to place the IOL in and uh, clean up the cortex, uh, so this is where we go. Uh, just acknowledge to my uh, fellow residents and uh, about Dr. Kushal and his residents for making this wonderful presentation, and my dear friend, Dr. Nivian, 
uh, for contributing whatever he normally does. Let's go with cortex management. A complete cortical cleanup is essential to decrease the incidence of early and late uveitis and a posterior capsular opacification. The instruments that you use could be a coaxial irrigation aspiration system or a bimanual irrigation aspiration system. These are the various types of tips, and you can see the length of a coaxial cannula, whereas a bimanual has a slight bend here. And you can also see the openings in the tips that are present. The instruments used for irrigation and aspiration can be automated or manual, and the automated systems in irrigation and aspiration have the following advantages. One, the vitreous is pushed back to ensure uh, safety of the posterior capsule. There's a less chance of endothelial damage due to a well-maintained anterior chamber, and easier uh, irrigation aspiration happens because of the open and accessible capsule of phonesis. Manual irrigation aspiration, however, has great flexibility, a greater surgeon control, and is easier to learn. You also have central PC polishing and cap whack mode, which is done after the entire capsule, uh, the, the entire uh, cortex is cleaned. There are difficulties that are faced, and the reasons that you see is, is one could be because of the long pathway tip of inside the tunnel, difficult verticalization of the tip, as well as access to the, to the capsule equator. There could be increase in flu fluid leakage and decrease of the chamber depth due to divarication of the incision lips. A smaller rexus could make a life difficult for you, and also a distal or a decentralized rexus could make this spot. As you saw, Brilliant surgeons like Dr. Venkatesh handling a small pupil with such consummate ease, but for most others, lesser models, it can be a pretty dangerous task too. So meiosis is something that you need to avoid. And of course, the corneal phones as Dr. Avias beautifully described in her video. These are the various flow rates. I'm not gonna go into that because a lot of theory has been done. Let's go into the videos. Yeah, so here you see uh, using a bimanual uh, irrigation aspiration happening here. This is technically the easiest to perform because the chamber is well maintained and you can get the entire thing off. You can see how easily you can get the entire cortex off here. Now, this is gonna be a difficult case because if you notice, there's been a a PC rent that has happened, and this is where you use your dry aspiration. The trick here is to make sure that the chamber is adequately maintained, and when you are coming out, always remember, do not panic. Make sure that you remove the phaco tip first, and then keep the irrigation properly maintained, and then you can gently tease the remaining cortex without disturbing the anterior hyaloid phase, and this case goes on pretty smoothly. The previous uh, thing, please. Right, so in a, in a smaller pupil with a posterior polar cataract, that's beautifully demonstrated by Professor Venkatesh, the hard job is already done after you aspirate or you remove the nucleus. The rest of it, you do a gentle hydrodissection here, form the chamber well, and then you go ahead and gently inject in that, in that space so that you can lift the epinucleus without a problem, and that makes you end up getting a nice, decent irrigation aspiration, and you can then aspirate the epinucleus as well without any such problems of the fluid going and disrupting the, PC, uh, the posterior capsule here. You can see that, even though it's slightly thick, but with adequate vacuum, you can actually get the entire epinucleal plate also out with irrigation and aspiration. So this is the end of the surgery. If you see, this is a very interesting technique where you actually hydrate the lower part of the, cat, of the cortex, which is there, which causes the cortex to come out pretty easily. And there's a nice uh, demonstration here of a carpet bagging where you can go and pull two ends of the cortex 
and simultaneously bring it out. If you watch this, you go to one end there, you bring it out to the center, then you go to the other end, and then you bring out the next. It's like, you know, like a carpet bagger, and that's how you get that remaining bit of cortex out. Coming to intraocular implantation, the incision of the intraocular lens is a step that, if well done, will hardly take any time. The two uh, prerequisites are for the viscopressurized eye and having an adequate wound size. You could use the holder folder method, where various types of uh, holders and folders are available. The eye hole may be folded longitudinally along the long axis or transversely. And the transverse technique is not used nowadays because you need a larger incision and it is a little more cumbersome. You have various injecting systems you have, which are designed for particular eye holes and are supplied by the manufacturer. And one should familiar, familiarize oneself with the particular system by reading the literature provided by the company. Irrespective of the injector system, the leading haptic should always be released under the, cap, uh, 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 the capsular rex's margin. And while the lens is coming out, the haptic should be kept horizontal. The advantages are smaller incision, disposable cartridges, and a training haptic may be inserted without coming in contact with the external ocular tissues. Let's go in with the videos. This is being done under Wisco, so you know that the IOL is being, you can see the, the haptics coming out horizontally, and then you use your side second, second instrument to gently tuck in the trailing haptics as well. So that's how it's done. You can make sure that everything is properly tucked in. And this is where you have the technique that is followed by a lot of surgeons these days is hydroimplantation, where you use the second instrument, use your uh, irrigation cannula to form, form the anterior chamber, and then you inject the lens in. This has multifold uh, advantages. One is you don't need to re uh, inflate the bag with Wisco, which then requires removal, and, uh, that's, and it kind of works beautifully in this case. Just this last one particular presentation, um, uh, in case where you have a, a PCR, you can see that the haptic is being brought in horizontally. And once it is placed inside, you can actually inject this beautifully into the bag without having any further issues. We're going to stop with this. And I'm going to thank my friend Divian for his lovely videos, without which this would have not been possible, and my department at Sri Lakshminara Institute of Medical Sciences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for the excellent videos. And if you notice, he had how he went beautifully along the arc of the capsule to remove the cortex. So that is the secret of uh, doing a complete No basis for knowing who actually taught me that technique, so. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's ragging. Any. Another useful uh, tip which you would have observed uh, during one of his video presentation was the injecting the viscoelastic substance beneath the epinucleus. I think that will create a leverage for you to remove the, that was one of the important tips for the, all the postgraduates. So you are struggling with your epinucleus removal, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to actually uh, inject your OBD just beneath the epinucleus and elevate it so that uh, the aspiration becomes easier, so the cortex removal becomes easier. So one of the important take-home messages for all the postgraduates. The other thing was when, even with the rent, when the cortex was removed, every time he held the cortex and stripped it across the chamber fluctuating. So that is the secret of preventing vitreous also from getting pulled during the cortical wash, and thereby the retina is safe. We had a very interesting session. Thank you so much. If you have any... Uh, that comes to the end of this session. Thank you so much, all the wonderful speakers who made it so much uh, uh, interesting for us to learn, including the chairpersons. And thank you, delegates, all the delegates sitting here and who attended the session. We conclude the session. Thank you.
Good morning all. I request all the delegates to be seated. Can I call upon Dr. Shanti Shelvan, Dr. Aishwarya Janani? Yeah, please. Good morning, everybody. 